Invincible season two is over and it kind of feels like almost nobody cares. There's been a lot of talk online about the enormous hype discrepancy between season one and season two. And a lot of that has to do with the glacial pace of production and creator Robert Kirkman's masochistic insistence on opting for a four-month mid-season break. And despite the fact that viewership ratings are up, Season 2 hasn't been able to capture the zeitgeist anywhere near as effectively as Season 1 did. But I think there's something else that has been holding this series back. Something bigger and much more foundational. Something that Kirkman and Prime Video probably should have seriously considered before ever putting pen to paper on the pilot. And it's that Invincible should have never been a television series at all. That's right. It should have been an animated film franchise. Thank you for your service, sir. Anytime, you pathetic ingrate. I know that most people really love this show. In fact, come to think of it, I love this show. And I love it, and you love it, and we love it because, funnily enough, there's a lot to love about it. But that doesn't mean there hasn't been a pretty consistent chorus of good faith criticisms dogging this series since its inception. So what we're going to do here is break down the three most pervasive and persuasive arguments fans have against Invincible as it currently exists and then explain how each one of them would be a non-factor if the source material was adapted into an animated film series instead of an episodic series. But before we jump in, I just have to reiterate that on the whole, I do think Invincible is generally pretty great as is, it's just that I think a lot of the issues the show is experiencing with this growing lack of fan interest probably could have been squashed before ever taking root if Kirkman and company had the foresight to condense, distill, and kill some darlings here. So number one, too much screen time given to uninteresting side characters. Look, I understand that much like Marvel and DC, the Invincible comic series is home to a shared universe of heroes, villains, and civilians. But let's not kid ourselves here by pretending that every single one of these characters is as fascinating, layered, or watchable as Nolan and Mark. Full disclosure, very few of them are. In some ways, Invincible supporting characters suffer greatly under the weight of trying to live up to the atomic charisma bombs that comprise the series' top build cast. When stacked up against them and their stories, everything else just kind of feels like small potatoes. And before you can say anything, I'm well aware that side characters aren't meant to be as interesting or engaging as main characters. That's why the show is called Invincible and not Rexplode. To be fair though, the show does do a great job of trying to give each of its bit players some in-depth characterization and nuance. But when their development is coming at the cost of advancing the far more interesting A plot, all the real estate we're spending on rounding out the B team starts to become pretty detrimental to the overall viewing experience. And I don't know if this is just a me thing, but do you ever find yourself watching a scene with Rexplode or Duplicate or the Lizard League and start thinking to yourself, first of all, who the f named these characters? But more importantly, in what world is this more interesting than what's going on up in Supermax Space Prison with Nolan and Alan or whatever's going on with Mark and Adam Eve or Debbie? It would be like if you were watching Breaking Bad and you had to spend 15% of every episode watching Bogdan struggle with finding quality hires for the car wash or having to sit through a C-plot where Walt's principal is studying at night school to get her master's degree. Nobody tuned in to Breaking Bad for Bogdan and Walt's principal, and nobody is tuning in to Invincible for Rexplode and Duplicate. So why do we need to see them so much? Then there's the entire Amber situation. It's obvious that the show has been using Mark's relationship with Amber as an MJ Peter Parker parallel that allows them to pit the human teenager side of Mark's personality against his Viltrumite hero side, but I'm sorry, there's really just no excuse for spending this much time on an uninteresting relationship that A, nobody cared about, and B, everybody knew was never going to work out in the first place. I get that the intention of giving these side characters so much screen time is to enhance the world building and make the Invincible universe feel more lived in and dramatically engaging, but personally, when I think of Invincible's biggest strengths and selling points, world building isn't really the first thing that springs to mind. 
What makes Invincible a special story with the ability to capture as many dedicated fans as it has is the unique and often heartbreaking dynamic between Mark and Nolan and the impending threat of the Viltrumite takeover. That's the emotional center of the show, that's the narrative center of the show, and deviating from it so often only serves to make me forget why I even fell in love with the series in the first place. If Invincible was adapted into a long-running film series of, let's say, I don't know, like five to seven feet length movies, we'd still have plenty of time to get acclimated with the side characters and learn more about the world Mark and Nolan inhabit, but we wouldn't have to spend so much time running in place with the B-team as we are now. I understand that Invincible's whole hook is taking the what if superheroes had real problems trope and amping the drama up to 11, but sometimes I can't help but feel as if we're wasting precious screen time focusing on the wrong problems of the wrong superheroes. Speaking of precious screen time, number two, less than optimal animation. Notice how I say less than optimal and not something silly and disrespectful like absolute dog shit. Because I'm not going to be a backseat YouTuber right now and say that Invincible's animation sucks. Because it doesn't. When you think about how long and intricate these episodes can be, I can only imagine how difficult and stressful it must be for the art department to get things done in a timely manner. That being said, could you imagine how much better, how much more detailed and artful and expressive Invincible could be if it had the budget of an animated film franchise instead of a cartoon series? Given the immense workload and relatively limited staff a show like Invincible has to work with, the art department really has to pick and choose its battles. And usually that means picking and choosing literal battles in the show to devote much of its time to, leading to a chronic and widespread dip in animation quality for low action dialogue scenes. But of all the nitpicks and grievances Invincible fans have had over the past three years, there's been nothing as frustrating as the uncommonly long wait time between season 1 and season 2. The ungodly amount of frames Invincible illustrators have to render in order to create their 8 hour long seasons could have been significantly condensed if Kirkman was willing to trim some of the fat throughout the adaptation process and distill the core story of the comics into a handful of two and a half hour films, which in turn would probably result in far less agonizing wait times for the fan base and a much cleaner, detailed, and aesthetically pleasing end product. Number three. The villain of the week problem. This one is kind of tangentially related to the first point, but I promise it's leading somewhere important, so just bear with me for a second. I've become quite familiar with the Invincible comic run since season 1 wrapped up in 2021, so without spoiling anything, I'm well aware of the fact that many of the seemingly unimportant villains we encounter throughout the first two seasons end up playing a much more pivotal role within the main storyline than you might initially expect. But regardless, did we really need an entire episode in season 1 dedicated to taking down D.A. Sinclair? Sure, it was a great opportunity for the show to poke fun at and satirize incel culture, but beyond that, I can't see any thematic or narrative reason to have sunk so much time into this guy. We all know his Rihanna men are going to be useful to Cecil in the future, but there are about a million different ways Kirkman could have introduced Sinclair's creations without effectively giving him his own episode. Then you have characters like Doc Seismic and the Lizard League that only really serve as an entryway for the show to satirize lame, mustache trolling comic book villains. But it's with characters like this where Invincible begins dancing dangerously close to developing something I like to refer to as Deadpool Syndrome. Which is what happens when a comic book adaptation attempts to satirize common tropes of the genre without ever managing to justify the satirization with a thoughtful subversion or fresh and challenging perspective on the matter. In other words, if you're going to present us with these hammy depictions of silly comic book villains, you're going to have to come equipped with more than just a sly wink and a nod to prove to us that you're actually above all that. Otherwise, you're just slapping a thin veneer of self-awareness over played out cliches and trying to pass off your smugness as genuine deconstruction. Angstrom Levy seemed to have a lot of potential to be a worthy arch nemesis for Mark in season 2, but after his introduction in episode 1, we don't really see him again until the big showdown in the finale. Between barely getting to know this guy and the 4 month mid-season break, how does Kirkman expect viewers to care about their conflict anywhere near as much as we cared about the mind-blowing season 1 finale? I mean, seriously, how and why did we go from heartbreaking, earth-shattering battle between father and son in season 1 to 
Mark killing some galaxy brain portal pooper we barely even know in season 2? From a thematic standpoint, Angstrom's conflict with Mark was actually quite poignant and thought-provoking, because at this point in the story, Mark's greatest fear is turning into the cold-blooded Viltrumite conqueror he believes his father to be. The fact that Angstrom has knowledge of countless realities where Mark becomes just that makes him the perfect adversary for Mark at this stage in his development. Which is great, but if he was going to be so important to the endgame of this season, why did we spend more time on fucking Donald than him? I just, I don't even But no matter how many times I begin to suppress yawns during this show, all it takes is for a single Viltramite to show up and place a menacing hand on Amber's neck for me to jolt back to life with full attention on the screen. I mean, Jesus, this scene with Anissa was absolutely perfect. No notes, bravo. Take my money, Jeffy baby. But ironically enough, it was rewatching this exact scene that inspired me to start making this video criticizing Invincible. Because again, when you have this unbelievably enthralling plot with the Viltrumites and Nolan and Alan, it starts to get very taxing to sit through all the comic booky filler plots and villains Kirkman feels the inexplicable need to prominently showcase. It's like, come on man, you gave us one of the best villains in the history of comic book adaptation in season 1, you gave us a taste of his terrifying and fascinating civilization of conquering space fascists, and perhaps most importantly, you gave us Mark, the most exquisitely flawed and relatable protagonist any writer could ever hope to put to paper to get sucked into the center of it all. So again, I ask you, why in Bezos' name are we watching a show about sequids and lackluster lizard-themed villains so much of the time? Honestly, I wouldn't care about all the second stringers getting their shine if their sauce levels were anywhere close to the sauce levels of the A-Team. But unfortunately, I am saddened to report that the sauce simply is not there. The sauce is lost, folks. The sauce is lost. I know Kirkman and Seth Rogen are currently working on a live action film adaptation and I'm almost positive they'll be forced to grapple with a lot of the things I've discussed in this video while writing that film. But considering the lukewarm response to live action remakes of beloved animated series like Death Note and Netflix's recent Avatar series, there's a very good chance that fans of the comics and the show won't take very kindly to this type of typical Hollywood redundancy. So to close this out, I don't want anyone's main take away from this video to be that I think Invincible sucks. I genuinely do love the show, and I'll be patiently waiting for season 3 to drop, at which point I'll be happily watching. With the MCU on life support and DC in the middle of a massive revamp, there's admittedly not a lot of fierce competition in this genre at the moment, but despite all my critiques, I still think Invincible is probably the best comic book adaptation currently airing in 2024. I just think the series has some pretty glaring issues that could have been non-issues if Kirkman and co would have went the film adaptation route from the jump instead of trying to stick their hands in both pots. And I know I could spend the next 10 minutes mapping out exactly which parts of the comic run I would cut, change, and adapt to condense things into a tight film franchise, but I'm not a fan fiction writer, I'm a video essayist, and in case you haven't heard, we don't really like work. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching, uh, like and subscribe to see more videos like this, and I'll catch y'all soon.